everybody. Uh, for those uh, who don't know me, my name is Magda Groman and I'm the Associate Director for the Center for Value, Values in uh, Medicine, Science and Technology. I always try to remember the name correctly because it's a long name of, of our center. Uh, but anyway, let me just uh, share with you some of the um, um, announcements first and then general remarks about our series that is just about to uh, be concluded tonight. Uh, so first the announcement. We are going to um, uh, hold a conference in April and it's going to be April 13 and April 14 and the conference is open to the public and to the students and to the faculty so please uh, visit our website and uh, there you'll find uh, the link to the registration site. So please pre-register for the conference and we would love to see you all um, in, in April. So that's it in terms of the announcements. And uh, now I'd like to share with you some of the um, remarks. So it seems that we've, uh, we've come a long journey in discussing the relationship between science and policy making and, and politics. And we have started the, the entire season with a lecture on, um, we, we tried to discuss whether the science um, the scientific findings on climate change can serve, um, can play a significant role in democratic process. That was a lecture by Dr. Mark Brown. Then we went on discussing how we should really consider uh, where are we going as a um, as a humanity uh, in terms of exploiting Earth, ex in terms of the growing population. And these issues were discussed by um, Kim Stanley Robinson, and that was in November. Uh, in January, Dr. Heather Douglas uh, enlightened us in terms of the, the constant battle for integrity in, in, in science and in politics. And tonight, we are going to conclude uh, with a talk that uh, addresses the issue of social science and policies. But Matt, I will give you the floor right now to introduce our speaker. Okay, thank you, Magda. Um, so it's, it's a challenge for me to introduce Nancy Cartwright. Um, first, because she's got so many qualifications and commendations and achievements that I could, we could sort of be here all night listing them. Um, and we would never get to her lecture, but also because uh, I have very sort of special personal feelings about Nancy. Uh, Nancy was uh, my advisor at UC San Diego, um, and uh, she was one of the main reasons I wanted to go to San Diego to, to get my PhD in philosophy. And uh, she's been a great supporter of my work. Um, so I'll, let me just start by telling you a little bit about, uh, about her and about her career. Um, she's a professor of philosophy not only at University of California, San Diego, but also at the London School of Economics. Um, she's been the president of the Philosophy of Science Association, the American Philosophical Association. She's got a number of, uh, of uh, major prestigious honors and awards, including the MacArthur Fellowship, um, which uh, hopefully you know about. Um, she's done important work in a wide variety of areas in philosophy of science, including the philosophy of physics and the philosophy of economics, so all the way from the hard natural sciences to the uh, social sciences. She's um, recently done a lot of important work on causation and the, uh, how we discover causation, causal links, and also how we use causal links, and one of the things that impresses me and really inspires me about her work is that she, she does both philosophical explorations of these ideas but also really practical, uh, gives really practical recommendations that can be used by scientists, policymakers, and others to understand how we do these things. And lately she's turned her attention to, um, to, the, to the notion of evidence, how we uh, use evidence in different contexts, and especially in policy, in areas like policy making and medicine, the idea of evidence-based policy um, and evidence-based me medicine and the different recommendation, recommendations that exist. 
for, uh, for understanding and, and making use of scientific evidence. And she's made some important recommendations there. Um, okay, so without further ado, let me, uh, please, please join me in welcoming Nancy Cartwright. Thank you. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here, um, not least because the center uh, works on just the intersection of issues that um, I care about and that I think it's terrifically important that we should be focusing on right now. Um, it's also a great pleasure to be here with Matt Brown. Um, one of the things I'm very proud of is uh, having uh, associations with uh, uh, people uh, who do really distinguished things um, already early in his career, like Matt Brown. So it's great, just a special pleasure for me to be here this evening. Um, let me begin. In 2004, in the London borough of Herringay, 17-month-old Peter Connolly was found dead in his crib. The child had suffered fractured ribs and a broken back after months of abuse at home. His mother, her partner, and a lodger were jailed for his death. Peter had been seen by health and social services professionals from Herringay Council 60 times in the eight months before he died. There were two kinds of governmental responses to this that I shall discuss. First, the Minister of Education, Ed Balls, sacked the Director of Children's Services in Herringay, Sharon Shoesmith, with immediate effect in a live press conference on television. And as you see here, she has since won a Court of Appeals battle against the dismissal on the grounds of unfair procedures. She hadn't been allowed to present her case. Now, Ms. Shoesmith defended herself and her services. We should not be put into blame, she said. It does not produce anything productive, and it obscures the bigger picture. A BBC News interviewer argued to the contrary. He said, if nobody accepts the blame, how can we stop this happening again? Okay, that was the first government response. The second is Tony Blair, then Prime Minister. He argued that the government can make children and young people more safe by identifying at-risk families and intervening early on behalf of the children in those families. And I'm quoting from Tony Blair. Let me summarize my argument. I am not talking about trying to make the state raise children or interfering with normal family life. I am saying that where it is clear, as it very often is, where it is clear as it very often is, um, at young age that children are at risk of being brought up in a dysfunctional home where there are multiple problems, say of drug abuse or offending, then instead of waiting until the child goes off the rails, we should act early enough with the right help, support and discipline framework for the family to prevent it. It may be the only way so maybe the only way to, I think it is, save them and the wider community from the consequences of inaction. According to Blair, we can predict. We can then intervene. Now, both these responses are morally questionable. Look first at Blair's. Blair's program is intended to identify at-risk families but there is evidence, and offer help. But there is evidence that labeling, can you hear me? Okay, sorry, somebody's holding his ear, so I just thought maybe, since I've almost lost my voice. Okay, anyway, Blair's uh, program is supposed to identify at-risk families and offer help, um, but there is evidence that labeling families at risk can increase the anxiety of the parent and thereby increase the likelihood of abuse or neglect. Also, as other experts report, quote, parents who have been through the process of child protection investigations and registration are often bruised and stigmatized by the experience and wary of accepting the help or support which may follow. So the program may cause harm overall. Also, the question of parents' rights and family autonomy looms. As the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy puts it, parents have moral and legal rights regarding their children. They have the liberty to make decisions on behalf of their children regarding matters such as diet, schooling, and association with others. Also, that's the end of Stanford Encyclopedia quote. Also, as, other argue, as others argue, the government acts paternalistically when it, quote, aims to take over control of what is properly within the individual's own legitimate domain 
of judgment or action, end of quote. Now, in giving directions to parents, the government substitutes its judgment of how to raise their child in place of the parent's judgment. So all this considered, even if the interventions will produce the predicted benefits, there remains a question about whether such interventions are justified. As to blame, which was the other response, blame is retributive and is often vindictive. It attacks the moral character of the culprit, not the deed. It vilifies the culprit, and as Gareth Williams explains, there is clear evidence from social psychology that blame is frequently and inappropriately attributed to the free choices of individuals, tending to overestimate the extent to which people's behavior is due to internal dispositional factors and to underestimate the role of situational factors. Blaming a person is more than grading them negatively. It is, as Jay Wallace argues, to make them the object of negative emotions, resentment, indignation, and subject to adverse treatment, avoidance, reproach, scolding, denunciation, remonstration, and punishment. We can listen to a later BBC interview to see some of the effects of blame in the case of Peter Connolly. Well, clearly I'm relieved with the judgment. Um, but when I actually read the judgment itself and read what the judges have said, I feel um, you know, very much that they have identified, they have recognized what it was I was living through during those few weeks in that they, they are very clear that I was scapegoated. Uh, and that's clearly what I was experiencing. So there's some um, comfort in it uh, when I read that judgment today. But it is always um, with the uh, knowledge that all of this started with the brutal death of a little boy. Um, so it can never be a moment of celebration, really. Um, what impact has it had on you and your family over these last two and a half years? Well, it instantly wiped away the life that I knew. Um, it instantly wiped away many of my friendship groups, for example. Um, it wiped away my livelihood. And it absolutely brought my career to an instant halt. Um, so I've been unemployed and unemployable. Did you find, because many people think it was very personal, there was a, a, a vilification, if you like, the word that's being used. How was it on the receiving end of that? It was horrific. It was frightening. I was, I was terrified. Um, I had death threats. I mean, of course, I was, I was afraid on the streets of London. Um, and it wasn't just me and my imagination. You know, uh, the police were uh, advising me, you know, that I was probably at risk. And when people begin to take photographs of you on the trains, on the buses, um, and point you out and, 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 and you know, start to shout, that's that woman, um, it's, you're fearful uh, of where that can go. When you look back at it, and when this... I think that's probably enough. You've, you've got the idea. Um, so there were two reactions. Blair's early intervention proposals and Ed Ball's and the first BBC interviewer's public blame of the Children's Services Director. These may or may not, all told, be morally acceptable responses. My concern is to hack away some mistaken philosophical stances that prop them up stances that are currently widely adopted in policy analysis, from child welfare to crime to education to economic development. These involve a circle of ideas about objectivity, certainty, and causality. Okay. Causality matters because policy analysis focuses on prediction. Okay. What will these actions produce if implemented? And it focuses on evaluation. What did the actions under scrutiny result in? Now, there are three mutually supporting stances that I worry about. First, we bank on certainty. Second, we suppose objectivity is the path to certainty. And here, objectivity means eliminating the subject, um, especially judgment, and using methods that have manuals that fix correct procedures. And the third is we assume that causality is linear and God-given. There is a vigorous, increasingly influential movement championing objectivity and certainty in social policy deliberation. It insists that for policy evaluation and prediction, 
we rely only on methods like randomized controlled trials or RCTs. We rely only on methods that can provide certainty. In the ideal, that not in real practice, but in the ideal at least, RCTs can clinch causal claims, and they can do so without the intrusion uh, of subjective judgment. Okay, so from, the from this position, we slide easily into our third problematic assumption, that causality is linear and God-given. So let's look at linear first. The slide here is easy, and easy not to notice. That's because looking through the lens of RCTs, complex causal webs get projected onto a line. And here's a picture of the causal process as RCTs tell it. Now there are two different senses of linear involved in this image, and we tend to suppose both. First, what we label the cause, the policy, whose results we aim to predict, or the actions we want to blame for some disastrous outcome. The policy, so that what we label the cause is seldom enough on its own to produce the effect in question. It needs help. Generally, a whole team of support factors must act together with a highlighted cause, or no contribution to the effect will be produced. Epidemiologists illustrate this with what they call causal pie diagrams. And here is an example based on the work of, uh, based on the work of uh, Harris Cooper um, on the effectiveness of homework. So uh, Cooper argues that homework uh, by itself uh, will not be effective for raising scores, uh, that it needs uh, a variety, a uh, complex of helping factors, uh, or it won't produce the expected results. Here is one from a child welfare lecture by a colleague of mine. Now, I refer to these epidemiolo epidemiologists, call them causal pies. I refer to them not as pies, but as causal pancakes. And that's because to make pancakes, you need flour, milk, eggs, and baking powder. And you need them all if you were to get a pancake at all. With just three of the four ingredients, you don't get three quarters of a pancake. You don't get a pancake at all. Now, the cake diagrams make vivid a crucial point. That is that you need a host of factors operating with the highlighted cause if you're going to get an effect at all. So they make a crucial, vivid, a crucial point but they also make it look too simple. For most policies, the connection between the cause and the effect is not immediate. There's a long chain of steps in between. Now, and each one of these steps has to occur at the appropriate time to lead on to the next. Consider this diagram from the family nurse, nurse family partnership. Okay. I don't imagine you can see it very well, but give you an idea what these diagrams look like. Already this picture is more complicated than my simple domino image, since the policy does not initiate just a single causal chain, but it, it initiates three different policy actions that lead by interwoven chains of intermediate effects to the targeted outcomes, less child abuse and fewer young people arrested. And that's what you see over on the far right-hand side as the targeted outcomes. Focus, though, um, just on the bottom line, which I'll reproduce here for you. This one looks like a straightforward linear sequence. To describe it thus, however, is to miss the point about support factors and causal cakes. What we picture as the cause typically cannot produce the effect on its own, okay, um, but needs the help of a whole team of support factors. And that's going to be true for each step and the causal sequence. So causes don't produce effects on their own, they need help. And when each cause, each next has to produce the next step, um, you're going to need um, at each step uh, a panoply of helping factors. So there's not just one causal cake here, but a different causal cake for each step. So it looks something more like this. And if you want then to identify the support team necessary for the initial nurse family partnership causes, to produce the targeted outcomes, you're going to have to gather together all the members of all the support teams from each stage and graph them together in one huge causal cake. 
Recall, the point about coals or cakes is that all their ingredients have to be in place or you don't get the effect. To the extent that any of the necessary ingredients is uncertain, so too is the final outcome. Um, but look at our circle of problems. We, um, we bargain for certainty. The simple linear causal model makes this look a far better bargain than it generally is because the simple linear causal model leaves out all these additional factors that have to be in place or your policy won't be successful. So it seems to me that by focusing on the simple linear uh, causal model, um, it, we think certainty is a better bargain than it is. And that means that we often expect results that can't be achieved. And that leads to wasted money, wasted effort, and to heartbreak and dashed hopes. Also, we don't work to put in place the support factors that can help make our policies work because we haven't noticed the need for them. In addition, we blame perfectly good policies for failing that could achieve better results in better circumstances. And we despair of doing anything because we cannot find the miracle cure. After all, very often some of those intermediate factors are going to fail and um, you know, you're not guaranteed that um, this is a miracle cure and going to work all the time. The linear model and the emission of support factors also predisposes us to focus efforts on eliminating harmful causes at the head of a sequence, like family drug and alcohol abuse. And that can be a tall order. But it can be just as effective to remove support factors anywhere along the causal path. Consider the growing body of research on resilience factors. Resilience describes the product of a combination of mechanisms for coping in the face of adversity. Evidence from longitudinal studies suggests that a large proportion of children recover from short-lived childhood adversities with little de detectable impact in adult life. Encouraging resilience is important because resilient children are better equipped to resist, resist stress and adversity, to cope with change and uncertainty, and to recover faster and more completely from traumatic events or episodes. Okay, so that was my first point. Um, about not, uh, not noticing the um, helping factors by focusing on the linear model. But the, the other point about linear models um, and where we go astray in focusing on linear models is that linear models don't have cycles in them. But cycles can matter. Consider the UK's recent Monroe Review of Child Protection, uh, the uh, new government's um, sponsored review. Um, by a colleague of mine, Eileen Monroe. The review notes that policies, even good ones, can figure in negative cakes alongside positive cakes. The negative cakes diminish the good effects of the policy and can even, if they are strong enough, outweigh the good effects. You can sometimes unearth the negative effects by thinking through the causal process from beginning to end step by step, as I just recommended, in hunting for the full panoply of support factors. This kind of step-by-step -step review can be particularly important if any of the causal stages in between are self-reinforcing, so that the outcomes, negative or positive, escalate over time. Now, this is just the trouble that the Monroe Review pinpoints for one of the big UK child welfare policies. The policy was intended to improve welfare outcomes in children and young people. Uh, I'm going to put a graph up, and uh, CYP, you'll see on the graph, is, ch is uh, children and young people. The policy was intended to improve welfare outcomes in children and young people by providing stricter guidelines for what social workers must do in dealing with children and families and by better monitoring of what they are doing by ensuring that specific mandated facts about the family and the child are ascertained and recorded properly and that all the required meetings take place. Excuse me. But this policy, the review argues, can have serious negative effects alongside the intended positive ones. How so? Through various neg negative feedback loops. And have a look then uh, at this diagram from the review. Two negative loops are pictured, R1 and R2. Both start in the same way. Increasing the amount of prescription 
imposed on social workers, you can, um, it, it reduces their sense of satisfaction and self-esteem. In R1, and this is, I think, just R1 by itself, in R1, this increases staff sickness and absence rates. In R2, it increases staff turnover rates. Both these effects tend to result in an increase in average social worker caseload, which leads to social workers spending less time with the children and young people and their families. This, in turn, reduces the quality of the social workers' relationships with the children and their families, which then reduces the quality of the outcomes. So the policy may produce bad, unintended consequences. Worse, these negative effects can become amplified via the feedback loops. When the outcomes are regularly too unsatisfactory, this reduces social workers' sense of self-esteem and personal responsibility, and the negative cycle is set in motion again. Now, besides the habit of taking causality as linear, we take it to be God-given. But the kinds of causal principles we rely on for policy prediction are not God-given. They depend on intricate underlying structures. And our focus on objectivity and certainty takes our attention away from these underlying structures. Excuse me a moment. To make this point vivid, I use an example not from social policy, but from my own daily policies. I often write my lectures on paper and with a sharp pencil. I sharpen my pencils, well, I sharpen my pencils by putting a kite out my window. Now, I can do that because my study was designed by Rube Goldberg. Okay. Okay. Uh. Now, putting a kite out the window is a very effective policy for me to get nice, sharp pencils. But I wouldn't advise you to fly a kite to sharpen your pencils. Kite flying undoubtedly figures in the causal principles that govern pencil sharpening in my study. It's totally repeatable, and it would, for instance, pass any number of rigorous RCTs. Put the kite out the window on randomly chosen days, and you will certainly get more sharp pencils when you put it out than when you don't. But that principle is local. It depends on the underlying structure of my study. The causal role played by kite flying in my study is not God-given. It depends on a complex pattern of interactions and an intricate underlying structure. Here's another case, a familiar, familiar regu regularity. Kepler's law describing the elliptical orbits of planets. Okay? And here is the well-known underlying structure that gives rise to it. Now, of course, these are not typical social policy cases. Social policies suppose principles like, uh, quoting a few that I've uh, looked up recently, burnout causes turnover in child welfare service workers, or age does not, or apathetic, futile mothers are more likely to maltreat their children. These are clearly not God-given either, and surely it is implausible to suppose that getting a good social regularity, as those are purported to be, depends less on the details of the underlying structure than getting regularities between pure physical quantities as we have here, or in my study. Now note uh, that I'm not supposing that there are no human universals when I talk about loca the locality of causal principles for pol that we rely on for policies. Um, I'm not supposing that people in, a Ban in Bangladesh villages are essentially different from those in New York high-rises, nor across the 300 language groups and more than 50 non-indigenous communities who live in London. In fact, my two non-social examples of local causal principles work in just the opposite way by relying on other causal principles that hold very widely. My pencil sharpener depends on a number of fairly universal principles, from the laws of the lever and the pulley to the familiar fact that moths eat flannel. It relies on these to ensure that the arrangement and interaction of the components results in the causal principle I use to sharpen my pencils. So the fact, if it is one, that there are a large number of universal truths about human behaviors, emotions, and reactions, goes no way to showing that the kinds of causal principles we rely on in typical social policies will be anything other than very local. 
and our aspirations for certainty divert our attention to these kinds of local causal principles since they are the ones that we can nail down with objective methods, like RCTs. Flying kites in Nancy Cartwright's study sharpens pencils, or from JPAL, which is the MIT-based Jamil Poverty Action Lab, um, after a study in certain Indian villages, informing villagers of poor teaching in their villages and raising awareness of accountability mechanisms had no impact on teacher attendance. Now, those are the kind of things that you can RCT and become certain about. Our efforts, be, because of our aspirations for certainty, we divert our attention um, to local causal principles, and our efforts are taken away from the more difficult study of the underlying structures that make these causal principles possible. Building and justifying models of these structures is like building and justifying theory. It's hard. We must devise appropriate theoretical concepts with serious, detailed content, defend them, and show that they are applicable to the case. We require a large number of interlocking hypotheses, none of which is appropriately tested in isolation. And we must balance a plethora of epistemic virtues in judging how good the model is. And as all the philosophers in the audience will know, um, these epistemic virtues can conflict with each other and they're each highly contested. So here's a kind of um, an agglomerate of lists of epistemic virtues that a theory should have if it's to be acceptable. This is how we help decide whether a model or a theory is acceptable, um, uh, agglomerated from um, a variety of people with very different views and different arguments. Okay. There is no rule book for how to do this. And the results will always be, to some extent, controversial. That is, to do this, the job of uh, building a good model of the underlying structure. The results will always be, to some extent, controversial. That is the condition we must learn to live with and not, like Tony Blair, suppose that we can know, we can predict. Okay. The things we need to know are not easy to figure out. And we will increase and we will necessarily make mistakes. As Ernie McMullen taught, Ernie McMullen is the second from the uh, left there. As Ernie McMullen taught, controversy, far from being rare and wrong-headed, is a persistent and pervasive presence in science at all levels. So too with serious policy predictions. Now when it comes not to prediction but to evaluation, looking back to see what was responsible for an outcome, the focus on linear causal principles with their objective certifying methods, leads to skewed views about human error and individual responsibility. As Eileen Monroe of the Monroe Review explains in another piece, when a tragedy like the death of Peter Connolly occurs, the standard, yeah, you can read it there for yourselves, the standard response is to hold an inquiry, looking in detail at the case and trying to get a picture of the causal sequence of events that ended in the child's death. We are tracing a chain of events back, right? that's the domino picture, a chain of events back in time to understand how it happened. More from Monroe. Unlike the police investigation, which focuses on the perpetrators of the homicide, these inquiries, inquiries focus primarily on how the professionals acted, judging them against the formal procedures for working with families and principles of good practice. Just give me a moment. Now, where does this backward tracing stop? As Monroe argues, the, quote, events that bring the investigation to a halt usually take the form of human error, end of quote. Oh, no. Sorry, that's not it. It's the, she's going on. Practitioners did not comply with procedures or lapsed from accepted standards of good practice. That's the end of the quote from Monroe. But as the UK Department of Health explains, and I'm now quoting from the UK Department of Health, there are two ways of viewing human error, the person-centered approach and the system approach. The former, that is the person-centered approach, focuses on the psychological precursors of error, such as inattention, forgetfulness, and carelessness. Its associated countermeasures are aimed at individuals rather than situations, and these invariably fall within the control paradigm of management. Such controls include disciplinary measures, 
writing more procedures to guide individual behavior, or, as we've seen with Sharon Shoesmith, blaming, naming, and shaming. Okay. But as the Department of Health notes, aside from treating errors as moral issues, the person-centered approach isolates unsafe acts from their context, thus making it very hard to uncover and eliminate recurrent error traps within the system. The system approach, in contrast, takes a holistic stance on the issues of failure. It recognizes that many of the problems facing organizations are complex, ill-defined, and result from the interaction of numbers of factors. Now, the same worry um, is studied here in the US, in the US National Academy of Sciences to Air as Human, building a safer health system. Now, I'll quote from the, uh, the to Air as Human. The title of this report encapsulates its purpose. Human beings in all lines of work make errors. Errors can be prevented by designing systems that make it hard for people to do the wrong thing and easy for people to do the right thing. Cars are designed so that drivers cannot start them while in reverse because that prevents accidents. Work schedules for pilots are designed so they don't fly too many consecutive hours without rest because alertness and performance are compromised. The National Academy of Science report urges the focus must shift from blaming individuals for past errors to a focus on preventing future errors by designing safety um, into the system. Or, to put it in the terms I have been using, we should be less concerned with the easier to certify causal sequences that start with human error and end with disastrous consequences and far more with understanding and restructuring the underlying structures that make this kind of causal sequence likely. As Monroe notes, when a society is shocked and outraged by a child's terrible tale of suffering, there seems a basic human desire to find a culprit, someone to bear the guilt for the disaster and to be the target of feelings of rage and frustration. This puts us, that's the end of quote from Monroe, this puts us squarely in the business of finding these local linear principles. And with Tony Blair, we can feel morally and epistemically safe in doing so. We are not likely to cast blame in the wrong places because these are the kinds of claims about which, with due care, our objective methods can deliver reasonable certainty, tracing these causal paths backwards. But the kinds of preventive measures this leads to, recall the Department of Health examples, um, disciplinary actions, writing more procedures to guide individual behavior, blaming, naming, and shaming. These kinds of preventive measures are often unlikely to stop these kinds of sequences occurring. As Monroe urges, child protection is a systems problem. At least it is in Britain right now. Um, and so are a good many other social problems, from poor childhood nutrition in Bangladesh and poor school attendance by teachers in Indian villages to crime, education, health, and climate adaptation almost anywhere. Our thirst for certainty and our admiration for methods that can run by, be run by rules must not lead us to buy cheap knowledge that can't serve our needs. Now, my final worry about trusting that good objective methods can deliver high degrees of certainty is that we very often don't know what we are testing with these methods. In one sense, we do. We, all, we know all too well, and that's the source of the problem. Our best objective methods for testing causal claims, like randomized controlled trials, require a precise characterization of both the cause and the effect. This is a crucial part of the study protocol. We must ensure that everyone in the treatment group gets the same treatment and that there are strict criteria for deciding whether the effect has occurred or not. Otherwise, the validity of the causal conclusion is impugned. This, in turn, means that treatment and effect descriptions tend to be couched in concrete operational terms. There's the rub. For policy prediction, we need causal principles that hold widely, at least widely enough to cover both the study situation and the target. Um, but these kinds of principles often relate not concrete concepts of the kind operationalized in a good study, but far more abstract ones. Now, to avoid getting into controversy 
about any specific social case, let me illustrate with a clear example from physics. Okay. The people living on this sphere are studying how bodies move when they are subject to no forces. They conclude, well, bodies subject to no forces move on great circles. And they are right for their own local circumstances. But what they record will not help people living here, where, uh, for whom the bodies will move along an ordinary Euclidean line, okay, nor here, right, where they will move in far more complex ways. The tragedy is that they have actually tested a useful, wide-ranging principle. Bodies subject to no forces move on straight lines, or the shortest distance between two points. They need a better theory if their results are going to travel. But there's no rule book for how to find it. Now, this kind of problem looms even larger for social policy because the same thing doesn't mean the same in different social settings. Consider another case from UK child welfare policy, not one that we, are, that we currently have strong evidence for, but where there seems cause to worry. In many cases, a child's caregivers, though not legally compelled, are encouraged or badgered into attending parenting classes. And this includes fathers. But what constitutes a father? Is father instantiated by biological father or, for example, male partner of the mother who lives in the household with the child or maybe male caregiver. Maybe the policy will be effective if the male caregivers or men living with the mother are targeted, but not biological fathers. If so, to focus on being a father would be to move to too high a level of abstraction, since only the more specific feature, male caregiver or male partner of mother who shares the child's household, enters into a reasonably reliable, reasonably wide policy. <coughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. On the other hand, uh, have I got the right one? Yes. Compelling the father or male caregiver to attend classes can be too concrete. Different cultures in the UK have widely different views about the role fathers should play in parenting. Compelling fathers to attend classes can fall under the more abstract description, ensuring caregivers are better informed about ways to help the child, in which case it could be expected to be positively effective for improving the child's welfare. <coughs> but it may also instantiate the more abstract feature, public humiliation, in which case it could act oppositely. And of course, it can fall under both at once. In any case, if the two more abstract features pull in opposite directions, there's no reliable principle to formulate at the more concrete level involving fathers. <clears throat> Nor is this pull in opposite directions an unrealistic hypothesis. We know from empirical research that there are varying outcomes associated with compelling or strongly encouraging parents to attend parenting classes, and also that these are correlated with varying motives. Unfortunately, we do not have sufficient theoretical probing to explain the variation and the correlations. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> Last night I couldn't talk at all, so I'm a big improvement over 24 hours ago. Now, my concluding remarks focus on how readily we manage to avert our gaze from the issues I have raised. For purposes of thinking about policy prediction and evaluation, it is important to distinguish three distinct kinds of causal claims. Oops. We seem stuck here. Ah, there. One, it works somewhere. This is the kind of claim we can clinch with objective methods like RCTs. It's the kind of verdict that a good post hoc evaluation can deliver. It worked somewhere there. A different kind of causal claim is it works. There's a very familiar expression. Um, I don't really know what it means. Uh, I take it from the way it's used 
that it means something like it works almost everywhere, or at least widely, or perhaps everywhere, other things being equal. And then thirdly, it will work here. And this is what we want to know when we deliberate about whether to adopt a policy. One is, of course, no guarantee of either two nor three. Now, my topic here has been with predicting policy outcomes. What will happen if we implement the proposed policy here? From what I have argued, okay, from what I have argued, uh, we can extract three kinds of facts that must be in place if claims like one, that is, it worked somewhere, work there in the study situation, for instance, if claims like one are to provide evidence that it will work here. Okay, the first is um, the causal principles that govern the outcome in the study must be the same as those here. Otherwise, what we learn about these principles in the study is just not relevant to what happens here. And whether these principles are the same will, I've been arguing, generally depend on whether the underlying social structures that give rise to them are the same. Okay. Second, there must be a good distribution of the support factors for the policy here. Otherwise, we won't get the effect at all, or far less of it than we expect, or the policy may even make things worse if it figures in negative cakes as well as positive. Third, the policy variables here must instantiate the concepts that figure in the causal principles shared with the study. It's no good sending fathers to parenting classes here if parenting classes don't function as learning opportunities here, but only as a source of humiliation. Now, you may think my distinctions are, excuse me, are obvious and ones we are not likely to lose sight of in policy deliberations or in policy advising, but not so. Let me illustrate with an example from a paper by Esther Duflo and Michael Kremer, who are part of a team of brilliant and dedicated development economists at the heart and core of JPAL, that MIT Center Jamil Poverty Action Lab. And they are avid advocates of RCTs. So here's the, already in line five of the paper, in one single sentence, all three kinds of claims are mixed together. The benefits of knowing which programs work I take it which programs work sounds like it works in general, okay. extend far beyond any program or agency, and credible impact evaluations. An impact evaluation shows that it worked there somewhere. Okay. Um, that credible impact evaluations can offer reliable guidance. That looks to me like it will work here for us, okay, to various organizations. Now, I take it from the language in use, okay. Um, that they mean which programs work is it works, impact evaluation it works somewhere, and reliable guidance is it works for us. Here, Duflo and Kramer slide seamlessly between it works there, it works, and it work, will work here. That's loose talk, and loose talk in proper academic settings where we are meant to subscribe to high scientific standards. Now, exactly the same kinds of slide occurs throughout evidence-based policy. To get policies that work here, we are urged to use policies that work. That's okay, supposing it works really means it works generally. If a policy works generally, and particularly widely enough to cover here, then trivially it works here. The trouble is that the standards for it works are not those for establishing a solid general claim and one using the concepts of the policy description. The standards are generally just that the policy, as described in the study protocol, has been shown to work in some study or in the best, most highly ranked policies in a handful of studies. Now, this is exactly what we see in MP Graham Allen's report. Let me just want to show you this. Ah. Okay. Uh, if you want to look at the table of contents here, um, what's circled up there, I hope you can see, is the way forward is what works. Here's what Graham Allen has to say. Okay. 
under the title, A New Rigor. So here's is his view of a new rigor. One of my primary recommendations is that a greater proportion of any new public and private expenditure be spent on proven early intervention policies. That is, bet what work that what works will work here. And here are the Allen standards for deciding what works. Well, you see the Allen standards for deciding what works are um, good RCTs. So he has good, so what works for him is established by good RCTs, which can only establish it works somewhere, uh, and yet those are the standards he's using to establish what works, and he's advising us to use policies here uh, that have been proven to work. Okay. Now, let's see, are we on? That's 36. Okay, this slide, uh, this easy slide from one to three is widespread. Here's a US example the Child Welfare League of America, okay, which promotes the implementation, that's three, it will work here, of programs that are well evaluated, that's one, it works somewhere. And look um, at what counts as well evaluated for the Child Welfare League of America, that is results from RCTs. Now, these are not isolated examples. The injunction to use what works is endemic, from health to crime to, justice, to crime and justice systems to child welfare to education to development economics. And the recommended standards for good evidence for what works are essentially the same across all these areas. And they share the same deep problem. They are fine standards for justifying that a policy works somewhere, but not for showing it works let alone it will work here. Now before my very brief conclusion, I should like to recall where we started. I began with some policy prescriptions that may be all right, but that certainly call for moral scrutiny. I worry that these prescriptions get supported by a set of dodgy views about certainty, objectivity, and causality. At the close, we have seen that these in turn are supported by the illicit conflation of distinct kinds of causal claims. And look again at the very influential Esther Duflo. As MIT described at the time of Duflo's Clark Award, her work, quote, uses randomized field experiments to identify highly specific programs that can alleviate poverty, ranging from low-cost medical treatments to innovative education programs. Well, randomized field experiments can be evidence that a specific program will work in a specific location, but only if my three conditions are met. The causal principles that govern the outcome in the study must be the same as those that do so here, and that will depend generally on whether you have the same underlying social structure, which requires a lot of very difficult theorizing. Okay. Uh, two, there must be a good distribution of the support factors here, and three, the policy variables here must instantiate the concepts figuring in the causal principles shared with the study. That's the uh, issue about the fathers and uh, humiliation versus learning. To say, as Duflo does, and many others as well, that either randomized control trials or randomized field trials identify programs that can alleviate poverty is loose talk, conflating different kinds of causal claims and giving a false sense of certainty and a false pride that our predictions are objective. The same thing happens in child welfare, in crime prevention, education, drug abuse. Now, we cannot afford to indulge in loose talk. We need to be clear exactly what it takes to provide reasonable confidence about our policy predictions. Otherwise, we bank too much on the results and disastrous consequences can follow. My parting thought to leave with you is that now, as then, we must take seriously the World War II warning. Loose talk can cost lives. Thank you. So we've got some time for questions, and we've got a wireless mic uh, going around, so if you'll... Excuse me.
Hi, thanks for your uh, talk. Um, from what you're saying, it seems to me that it's like, basically it's not what works, but like what um, is the least broken uh -huh, in the yes. sense of like, um, and I just about, if you could talk about like, I mean, how we have these ideas of like neglect or that kind of thing and how, I don't know, what comes to mind is also like um, how um, it's uh, so dependent on individuals and their willingness, whether it's like like something like substance abuse, like whether a particular modality is effective or not is hugely dependent on like the willingness of the individual and that kind of thing and how much is like outside of our control as far as from this over from top down kind of um, approach. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think uh, that sounds to me like uh, just what, one of the things I was trying to say um, uh, that there's a lot of individual variation. I don't want to uh, go away and be pessimistic that we can't do social policy. Um, I think one of the problems is that um, we, uh, at least in the UK and I think a little here, um, there's been a swing from um, expecting too much and finding that suddenly we didn't, we didn't solve all these social problems um, in a decade of uh, doing, quote, evidence-based policy, uh, so let's not bother with evidence anymore. Um, on the other hand, uh, the, um, you know, the drive to do it in development economics is really on the move. So, um, anyway, yes. With such a complex system, uh, how much hope is there that computers will someday take the randomness of human existence. If you start at one end and you get something at the other end, you, you get sort of that, the broken window theory of community revival. You know, if you, you, if you stop broken windows and graffiti, then businesses come and then this comes and this comes and then child abuse stops. I mean, there's so many factors involved that yes. it's almost like chaos theory applied to human behavior or maybe human ecology, if you will. Uh, well, you know more, I'm sure know more, know more about the possibilities of computers than I do. Uh, so let me drop the, 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 the computer side of the question. Um, but um, we, it is, um, social situations are very complex and that's why I had just wanted to mention I wasn't uh, trying to be too pessimistic. I mean, after all, we do have a fairly um, effective operating um, operating society here uh, and most children um, are brought up fairly well and safely um, so it seems to me that we've managed to um, evolve um, uh, some reasonable um, underlying system uh, that that helps with that um, and we do know a lot uh, it's just that we shouldn't overbid our cards but I'm not as um, uh, worried that we can't figure it out as as you might be if we look in the right place. I just think that we can figure it out better if we look, um, don't look only in one place, which is what we've been urged to do recently. Uh, thank you for this remarkably clear uh, analysis. Maybe he needs to shout. Hello? Yeah. Oh, there it goes. Thank you. I wanted to compliment you on this remarkably clear analysis. Uh, the structures presented are extremely interesting. I wanted to suggest the fact that these uh, structures have usually been in place and they have varied over uh, time. People mm -hmm. constantly find flaws and try different ways to fix yeah. them. It seems to me that something neutral with respect to structure could eventually give reasonable clues about which way to go. Uh, and so these things arise with a clamor to increase the resources allocated to dealing with the problem. What is the effect of a, an increase in resource without a change in structure? Add more social workers, for example. <coughs> I believe that an analysis in that it, way... As it happens, one of the... You've you picked a bad example because one of the structural problems is we don't have enough social workers. Yes, of course. Yes. <laughs> But I see the point, yes. But in general, uh, an increase in resource without increasing, without altering the structure yes. uh, uh, 
uh, should give s some possible insight into which structural factors are more valuable to consider changing. That's a very abstract yes. idea, no. but... Uh, no, but I think that that's, that that's partly what I was driving at, that um, it, 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 if you're just looking, um, I mean, just consider the, uh, the, the discussion, uh, the UK or the uh, UK Department of Health or the US report on the air is human. Um, in both those cases, it, it doesn't, th what they're arguing is it doesn't help um, to put more money at the beginning of one of these linear causal chains, right, because um, that's not eliminating, you, you can, you know, that's what happened in the UK. You can put more supervision on the social workers to see that they do what they're supposed to and it turns out not to solve the problem because the problem is uh, systemic. So maybe it cuts it down a tiny bit, but it doesn't really remove the reasons why it's po these kind of pathways are very likely to happen. Yeah, so I agree with you. Good observation. <clears throat> Thank you. My interest is always in trying to figure out how we handle um, hearing impaired children. And we've gone within the last 15 years of my career um, from a situation where we were identifying children at four and a half or five years of age to a point where we're now identifying them through the United States at birth before they leave a hospital with a need for parents to confirm that three to six months yes. later. Did you say hearing impaired? Yes, hearing impaired. I'm, I'm trying to hold this close. Is it not working? Okay, I'll talk louder, she says. I'll talk louder. I, I can project. Um, but one of the big things we have within the United States is a policy called ID, IDEA, which says that from birth through um, 18 years of age, and particularly from birth through three years of age, as a governmental policy, we are required um, to provide services to these children, and we are prescribed in many ways as to what those services should be. Um, if one wants to do a study or to evaluate whether or not the services that are required by policy and by price to be effective, we have to do the current policy plus a randomized, yes. um, that is, you, can, you cannot take something away from a child, you can only add to it yes. to see whether or not there is an enhancement. Of course, the problem is that And you better be in equal poise when you do that. Uh, there, there is multiple problems that are engaged in that as well. So I guess my question to you is, how do we eliminate a policy um, in a sense of, if a randomized RCT trial, um, and I'm engaged in multiple of them through the United States, if an RCT trial does not allow us to provide effective information to eliminate a policy, what do you recommend we do in order to take this situation away? Well, the, 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 the case you put is, a, is, is the easy one, um, because if you're doing an impact evaluation on a policy that's already in place, um, and the impact evaluation shows it has no impact, then you've done the job. Um, now. As a matter of fact, um, getting a null result in a, 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 getting no effect size in one of those trials obviously doesn't mean that the policy doesn't work uh, there because um, we know that you're looking at averages and you could have, the policy could have um, a good effect on half the population and a bad effect on the other. And if only you knew that, you know, you could target it to the, uh, the, the good half. But, um, so I, I probably misunderstood the question because you ought to be able to get rid of the policy if it's not working here uh, once you've done the impact evaluation and seen it doesn't have an impact. Now, it might be bad for other reasons than the fact that it's not having an impact. I guess I was asking for a suggestion of how you would do that politically. Ah. Uh, <laughs> because I think, I think there is sufficient evidence on multiple dimensions in probably in multiple dimensions, even the educational level and the way we're approaching that in the state of Texas on um, many of our measures. Um, 
But what is the next step if one can produce evidence? Do you have any guidance of how we take your message and make it more palatable uh, and easy to understand to our politicians who are the people making these policies? Uh, well, one thing is um, I've got no very good ideas about what to do uh, when um, the issue is not one of um, predicting whether it's effective or not, but I f f first, there seem to me legitimately lots of other issues that should enter into deciding whether a policy should be instituted. Um, Cost-benefit analysis, how, what other kind of policies there are, how much they cost. Um, their, as you would expect, um, their political, moral, and cultural acceptability. Um, sometimes, even if a policy's uh, not likely to work very well, um, there's a crisis and you need to do something uh, to restore calm. Um, so there are a lot of other things besides will it work, but um, if, if we implement it here. Um, but in, in the case where you've got um, people who want to um, claim that the policy is working or will work when there's good evidence to the contrary, I don't know what to do with that. I mean, when you're ideologically committed to having a policy, um, whether or not it's doing what it's supposed to do, I don't know how you convince people about that. I mean, I do um, think, I mean, at least we as academics can keep pointing out that um, they're lying. I mean, that, that, I mean, you might want to do the policy for ideological reasons, but you can't actually make the evidence say that it's going to produce the targeted outcomes. Um, I mean, maybe you want to do the policy despite its outcomes, like our drug policy. That, um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm sorry, I'm not, not, I'm not any help on how we actually do what we really need to do. <clears throat> Testing one, two. Um, I, uh, some of this is, is kind of over my head, but uh, I am a parent. And I've actually uh, witnessed or you know, maybe even experienced some of the problems that you talked about. And I apologize if this is somewhat simplistic or ignorant you know, on my part. But I wrote down a couple of things. It seems that uh, social policies seem to be reactive instead of proactive, which may lead to, uh, you know, probably leads to some of the difficulty in righting some of these wrongs. Um, and I, I wondered, I'm sorry? I said that's a good point, yes. Okay. And I wondered, well, in, in, for example, uh, a lot of parenting classes are only offered in places like prison or other situations where problems have already occurred. Um, another is like ethics or something like that is, uh, you know, first taught in college where um, maybe even only one course at best. Uh, and by then it might be too late where many, you know, people have already, um, 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 you know, their ideologies are already set. Um, wondered if, has it been considered that making uh, good parenting a part of our educational uh, curriculum, has that been um, considered and, you know, making educators your support team? Um, and the way teaching science can create scientists, it seems to me that teaching good parenting could create good parents. Uh, I think that, um, what little I know, that the idea of teaching parenting in schools is something that has recently been floated in the UK. Um, I wouldn't actually trust them to do it the right way, but, um, and so there might be some opposition uh, to it, but yes. And it's obviously, um, it, it, there's obviously those kinds of needs. And, um. My question was back to the RCTs. I think I, a lot of us agree in this audience that they're being overprescribed, I think. But one of the challenges, I work for a nonprofit and a lot of the federal agencies, um, probably with the best intentions, are thinking that causality leads to, you know, or that objectivity and RCTs leads to certainty. And so we have a feeding frenzy, it would seem, that this is the route to go. And I wondered if you, if one of the ways we couldn't make a case that it isn't always the best route is if you had any data to support the idea that I, I believe that it's narrowing the field of who's doing research or who's available to do evaluation research because it's very costly yes. and it the resources required beyond just financial resources to do RCTs. 
really narrows the evaluative field, and I think it actually decreases innovation and learning rather than increases certainty. Uh, well, I don't have an RCT on that, but I'm sure you're right. Uh, um, there, um, and I don't know, um, I ought actually to know whether there's any data. There are lots and lots of people making those arguments, and um, I know that, um, for instance, the, uh, the um, UK best practice in health policy, uh, the recommendations come from the National Institute for um, Health and Clinical Excellence, NICE, and um, they use grades, um, rankings of evidence uh, which have meta-analyses and systematic reviews of RCTs at the top and don't give much credit for much else. Um, and uh, so one of the debates I've been re recently, uh, I mean, you will have had probably lots of them, but the, uh, the practice, practitioners of uh, talking therapies, right? incredibly, it's not just expensive to do an RCT, but uh, a lot of treatments don't, and policies don't lend themselves to RCTs, even if they were morally acceptable and you had all the money in the world, um, they're just not the kind of thing that you can, could do an RCT, and you had a compliant set of subjects. They're not the kind of things you could do an RCT on. Um, and there's a great worry that those kinds of policies get shortchanged. Um, sure Start in Britain was um, criticized because it had a component in it where um, the um, money was, a uh, certain amount of money was allowed um, the community to decide what its needs were. So if you, if you were a community that happened to have a, a leisure center already, you wouldn't build a leisure center, you might put daycare in the leisure center. Um, or if there, it was too far to get to uh, the nearest uh, pediatric clinic, you might run free buses or something. So it left um, it up to separate communities. And there was a lot of criticism because, well, if you have that kind of a policy, we can't RCT it to see whether it's working. So I think that's the kind of thing you're worried about. And I know lots of stories and concerns. I don't know whether there's data about policies that are actually left along the side uh, because they can't be RCT'd, either ethically or for any of the zillion of reasons why they can't be. It's a real concern. Thank you very much for the talk. I certainly enjoyed it. Uh, one thing that occurred to me as you're moving near the close of your presentation is it was more and more compelling, I realize, because it seems so isomorphically really related to how societies can actually function. There's so many causal factors involved for any kind of outcome that you might desire from any kind of uh, policy initiative. To apply this to an example, which is something that's usually on my mind, is education policy. And I wonder if maybe <laughs> the analysis that you have introduced here might be quite apt in this circumstance, since just to enumerate a few of the causal factors that are often put, um, put into play here, sometimes the teacher occupies center stage as the most influential factor in look, reaching the desired outcome of a more educated citizenry, however grandiose you, you want to um, articulate it. Or sometimes it's how demographically rich the classroom happens to be. And some of, and obviously there are more factors that can be enumerated here, but one of the test cases, as it were, that's, that's used are isolated instances of success, say success academies, um, Kaplan or something like that. Um, so the charter schools, right? And I was wondering if this is maybe something that be that would play uh, that also applies to the worries you had pointed out here for different social policies, and that these isolated cases say, oh, they they certainly work because we have one case here that's kind of like a control lab study, right? And say, well, therefore, if all schools work this way, then we're going to have the exact same outcomes. I was wondering if you have any commentary on that note. Uh, well. You know, there's a case where um, the uh, the motivates doing randomized control trials because um, you look at a single case uh, and there's been a change and you don't know whether you don't you can't tell uh, putatively um, that the the change is due to the policy. Um, so it's because of cases like yours that the randomistas have um, really taken hold. Um, 
now, my own view is that you can sometimes tell um, that something's worked in a single case. We do it in physics all the time. So it's not, I mean, you, you, if you move around in social policy areas and um, evidence-based medicine, that they, they say it's certain things that are, you do in physics all the time are impossible. I mean, that's what upsets me is that, you know, uh, that there's no way to um, determine uh, causality in a single case. Uh, well, then they have problems because they don't have enough background knowledge. But anyway, um, but the, the moving from the single case out um, is, I mean, the reason that people have been interested in randomized controlled trials is because it's a way to show that you really did get the effect from the cause. Um, but that probably wasn't your issue, was it? No, I, th I think that's, that certainly touches upon what I was referring to. I guess what I was wondering is whenever you have some kind of test case, like for example, different charter schools, which stem from policy initiatives that try to target a multiplicity of different causal factors. Like I said, teachers, right? Teacher competence oh. or the competency of the different students. They say, okay, if we can instantiate this exact same state of affairs in every school, you're going to have the exact same outcome you're looking for. But obviously that seems yes. a little bit beyond the scope of what uh, a policy initi initiative could actually achieve. And I was wondering if maybe that's part of the reason there's so much frustration about education policies, because what we're asking for is just something that policy can't deliver? Yes, I, I do think they're asking for things that policy can't deliver. But also, in that case, um, it's, uh, there is a, a general issue um, when something has um, been tested in a study. Right? Um, as I said, the study protocol uh, usually requires defining the, uh, the policy very narrowly. And when you've got complex interventions like the ones you were mentioning, um, it's, again, very difficult to do one of these studies on. Um, but sometimes you do, like the nurse-family partnership is a complex set of in interventions. Um, and then there's, um, there's this back and forth issue. Um, well, what you've tested is this complex set of interactions. That's all you've tested. So if the next guy wants to adopt it, he should adopt that. Right? Well, um, you know, there are all sorts of problems with that is, that you were pointing out that um, we don't know whether that complex as described is what travels, if anything travels. Um, but then, um, so, but there's a real pressure for fidelity. Right? So fidelity is a big word in this area. Um, you know, uh, do just what happened in the protocol or we're not guaranteeing you anything. Well, they can't guarantee you anything anyway, but do we? Um, and, but, there's a, but there are good reasons for that, too, because um, like with the Nurse Family Partnership or the Sure Start Program or co complex interventions, um, there's an obvious, clear, reasonable, natural human tendency to try and cherry pick the cheap pieces. And we can't afford to do that whole complex thing, um, but let's see if we can't pick up a few of them and um, hope that works. And then, um, then the designers of the policy um, don't want to be criticized for having designed a policy that didn't work when you didn't actually do the policy they suggested. Thank you for answering my question. It would be far too easy to comment on certainty in the social sciences, so I will affectionately pick on the natural, natural sciences instead. Uh, you've already mentioned physics, so let's choose um, biology. Do you see any possible analogies between the, what your concerns for causality in RCTs with the predictive nature of, say, genetics? And specifically, there was the perception that once you had the genome mapped, then it would become trivial in the manner that we would look at it as source code. And this would specifically be concerned, or not necessarily concerned, but with the rise of um, cheap genome mapping. I mean, now pretty much anyone in the audience can do it for under $1,000. Do you see any possible uh, desire in the future to make connections between, once we have a v widespread population understanding of genetics, as in we've mapped a, a certain percentage of the population, with certainty the same way that we see with, like, for example, RCTs? I'm not sure I understand the question. I mean, it seemed to me that uh, what my friends who do a little bit of uh, worries about these things uh, think is that uh, it started out being too optimistic about how much knowledge we were going to have when we uh, mapped the human genome, and it turns out to be right that 
so far, you know, it's a co well, people are complex systems, and uh, but I'm sorry, I didn't see the. Well, that would be the exactly the reason is we understand that it's a complex system, but the same thing, of course, applies to humans as far as from any of the social sciences. Yes, and we yes. still desire that certainty, despite the fact of all the various factors involved. And w could you see the possibility of us wanting to simplify, even knowing otherwise, as far as genetic, w once we have that information, how genetics r result in, for example, rather than randomized control trials, we're seeing like, for example, oh, these genetics result in these circumstances, let's apply uh, sure. genetic engineering, for example. That's what people do, isn't it? And that's what the natural human tendency is. So you can see this being applied on large-scale policies. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I really appreciated the description of um, elaborating this very complex um, description of human relations that might lead to particular actions that, um, in, in, in any particular situation, for instance, the uh, abused baby. Um, same thing could be in cases of um, abuse of the elderly, for example. Um, but he here's the question, and, and this is not meant as a challenge at all. I'm, I'm curious about this. So we have a robust description on ontology of human relations that do not work, say. Uh, but what, what's the purpose of social policy? Is it to change the values of a society that is committing acts that are not acceptable. So to some extent, are we aiming at social construction by devising you know, m more complex descriptions? I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that I think that that's a good step. But we, we should also ask, w what is the purpose of the social policy? There's got to be some goals to figure out what is the right answer. Yes. or the, the So. It, it, it ultimately, is it to discover the values of the society? Because it will vary, right? In, in the, I can think of in terms of the elderly, in the United States, people tend to send their elderly to homes. In some cultures, that is considered horrendous. We, we wouldn't, you know, they would say that we wouldn't send them uh, someplace with strangers. So, um, <coughs> To what extent, how, how do we correct then with social policy? Do we want to correct the wrong values maybe adopted in a society or do we want to just discover what were the original functioning values and work with them? Well, who's we? Uh, well, supposedly the people who are doing the social policy. Well, but uh, so there are zillions, I mean, every, uh, high school principal, um, every committee chair, um, every head of a company, uh, every mayor, um, Congress, uh, state legislatures, they're all um, doing some kind of social policy. And there are zillions different um, aims and also zillions of different, I think, meta-attitudes about um, what kind of aims they should have or how the aims should cohere. and. Um, and, and then, of course, so there are the attitudes that um, the don't do anything attitudes too. So, so I don't think that's well, well, a I mean, sure. But then the purpose of having a very robust description then gets lost once we get to the application because we have different policymakers with different goals. Well, we do have different policy situations and different policymakers with different goals. Yes. Now, I mean, you might uh, want to think that for a, a wide range of issues that you're interested in, um, and a wide, you know, a wide swath of America, say, um, that the they all fall into a category of um, not not trying to change social values, but trying to um, adjust this tinker, right? Um, leaving the social values alone, you might think that and, and then be critical of that. Uh, but you know, there, I mean, it isn't as if there's a uniform, there's such a thing as we are doing social policy and we all have the same, um, the same attitude or aims towards it. Susan Combs is um, a very important person in the state of Texas. 
said that she got involved in social change because she got angry. So I'm going to ask you in regard to her question, um, do you think people have to be angry on an individual level in order to um, instigate social change? Uh, I think that's a psychological question that I don't have a view about. And probably have a rather biased view having been a student in the late 60s and early 70s. And things did change. Uh, you know, there were the marches on Selma and people were angry. Um, now whether that's necessary here in the United States, I don't have a clue. But we certainly were angry as young people. Not, not a whole lot changed, but there were certain significant changes. Uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Perez. Okay. Let, me, let me just remind you, this is our last public lecture for the year. Um, but we do have one more event, the conference in uh, middle of April, 13th and 14th. What's the conference about? The, the, con the, ti the title of the conference is, social is Science Policy Interactions and Social Values. So it's continuing the, uh, the topics that we've been looking at all year in our lecture series. Um, and please watch our website for more information about how to register. It's going to be here on campus um, on the, that Friday and Saturday. So thank you for coming. Thank you.